Hey guys, Terrence here again with another episode of Let's Talk Reef. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we are broadcasting only on Facebook today. Evidently, Restream had some issues, so those people out there on YouTube land, if you know them, let them know that we're only going to be on Facebook Live today. Uh, but uh, that's just the way it goes. We'll do a premiere of the YouTube uh, after the fact. But we've got an exciting show today, really cool show. I'm really excited to do it. was going to do it last week, but we had the Blackout Tuesday, so we punted it to this week and, uh, and got a great guest today, a really good friend of mine, Joe Caparata. Uh, who owns Unique Corals and Manhattan Aquariums out east. Um, we're going to bring him in here a second, in a second uh, to talk everything about coral colors, coral growth. Thank you, all of you guys. Patrick Agius, Alex Waries, Eddie Lush, Robert Cray, Steve Berlin. Hey, what's up, CJ? Sydney, Paul, Morris, Todd, Boss Hog White. You're in the house. And Derek Picker, of course, Mr. Automation. So thank you guys all for joining us. We got a good, good group here already that are joining us in. Wanted to say thank you, all of you that are customers, uh, for being the awesome control freaks that you are. And uh, we are still here at the Fugazi house in front of the Fugazi Aquarium doing the shelter in place. But it is going to be a different scene in probably two weeks because... They're relaxing the restrictions here in the Bay Area. We do have our office open. My office is open. Uh, I have been staying mostly at home, though, because I have an elderly mother at home. Uh, but uh, I'm going to be spending more time in the office over the coming weeks, and we'll be back in the studio for the next Let's Talk Reef, which will be on June 23rd. June 23rd, we'll have the next Let's Talk Reef. Don't know what's going to be on it yet, but we will have it then. Other news that we have uh, in the Neptune Systems world, yet another trade show has been canceled or punted till next year. Actually, I think it's uh, two of them. Well, maybe one. I can't remember. But for sure, Reefapalooza, definitely uh, in California, is not even going to be on this year at all. It won't be on until next year. And uh, obviously, I think I spoke last time that uh, MACNA has been delayed, till, or I guess put off until... Uh, next year as well. It will not be in Phoenix. It will not be in Phoenix next year. It will be in Atlanta. So the year is not shaping up good for meeting all of you control freaks in, in person. And uh, I can tell you right now, a lot of us really miss that. Um, uh, you know, probably more than I miss getting a haircut. You know, um, I was uh, laughing earlier with Joe saying, you know, I, I, I think I'm now at 1981, the last time I had hair this length. So uh, it's definitely it, it's definitely getting old. I hope they open the barber shops up soon. So I don't know what's up with you guys out there in Fishland, but we're going to be talking about coral colors and growth. So get your questions ready because we will have Joe on here in a second, and invite your friends to come and listen too. Because if you're here live, you will get the secrets later on on how to get twenty percent off on corals from UniqueCorals.com, while they last, of course. And there's some amazing things out there um, on their, their site. Uh, we'll look at it here in a little bit, but uh, lots of glowing corals. And many of the corals that I have in my aquarium here, I got uh, from Unique Corals as well. I might even talk to uh, Joe about a couple of those corals that I'm, I'm liking the way that they're looking as well. So who else we got here? Anybody else coming in with their questions? Get your questions ready for Joe. Oh, man, what else is going on with Neptune Systems? Well, the Tridents are still going out of the office, and we still can't keep up with demand. It's crazy. Uh, I cannot believe still um, how many people who have apexes, because obviously we know kind of how many people have apexes, how many of them have Tridents on them. Uh, there was a, 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 um, a thread on Reef to Reef just the other day where they were asking or polling, you know, what's like the most important piece of equipment that you've recently put on your aquarium? And I was just floored of how many people actually said the Trident and uh, the words game changer were coming up like crazy. Oh, we got some of my friends here. We got Richard Ross is in the house. Eric Shulis, who um, does uh, some of the video opening, or sorry, the uh, Trident um, animation that you've seen, that he did that. Uh, so he's here. We got Ryan Nash. We got Ty from out in Florida. So we got a great group. We got Dave Hammontree, the owner of Reef to Reef, is here. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Hammontree. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we got Joe Villavicencio. Okay, so I keep, keep trying to say his name better each and every time he comes in. Thank you, Joe, for joining us and uh, have your questions ready. Other things that are happening, it is not a scarcity to get your reagents any longer. And now that we've rolled out of the, the COVID thing, we're back and rolling. 
We still are you know, trying to keep up with demand as best we can, and we've got the reagent two-month kits available. It will be you know, a couple of months still before the reagent sixes come back into stock because we need to make sure that we can keep that consistent inventory across the board with all of our dealers, and so all of you guys have it. But uh, don't worry, it will be back. Uh, Stellarfly SBK, thank you for joining us. For those of you that are joining us, uh, if you have friends that are usually on YouTube, let them know that there's no YouTube today because Restream let us down, and so we're only on Facebook. So uh, what else is going on? Well, uh, working on good stuff here at home for my aquarium here. The uh, Fugazi 425 is moving along nicely. Uh, I don't pay nearly enough attention to it as I probably should and I have some things that uh, still need to do on it uh, for maintenance-wise. You'd think that if I was home, I would do a lot more maintenance, but it doesn't seem that way. Uh, but I do have a couple of other little DIY things that I'm working on to show you guys on a later episode, so stay tuned for those, things that will involve some uh, solenoid valves and whatnot. So uh, really cool, I think, the thing with a skimmer. It's a couple of different little projects that I'm working on. So we got that going, too. Uh, the... International. So we do have uh, finally a lot more gear going out to all you guys, uh, you know, basically buying our stuff up overseas in the EU and the UK. Uh, orders are flying out and the sales are amazing. You guys are going through product like crazy over there. So we're trying to keep up the best we, way we can. Um, we also have NSI that's, uh, uh, that's rolling again with a new NSI group. For those of you who are saying, how can I be part of the Neptune Systems Insiders? Well, it's something that we only put the call out for you guys every maybe year, year and a half, something like that. So you kind of missed it if, you're, if you didn't get it two, three months ago. Um, if you did uh, and you have not been contacted yet, it doesn't mean that you're not selected. It just means that you haven't qualified for one of... Uh, the kind of testing or product things that we have going on. I can tell you, while we are not in the, in the world of uh, pre-announcing anything uh, anymore since the Trident burned us so hard, I can tell you that the, um, uh, we do have a, a number of products that we are working on and uh, software and many different things. So the people in NSI, I think, are going to be, be absolutely pleased. So, okay little beverage talk here. So one of the things, um, kind of make a segue here for, for Joe to come on. One of the things that uh, people often ask me when they see my aquarium, whether it's online or um, uh, when I'm talking to them out and about and showing them the, the tank and whatnot, is just like, how do you get your corals to grow so much? How do you get the, all of that color in your corals? And, you know, I could probably give them a little bit of information about how it works in my tank. Maybe I'm just lucky. Maybe it's just the apex. Um, I don't know. But I know that there are experts out here who do this for a living. If they, if they try to sell brown corals, uh, yeah, they're, they're not going to be doing it for very long. So they, they have to be able to uh, grow corals, to be able to keep corals in captivity that, are, uh, that, that have the nicest colors for you guys out there. And moreover, a lot of these guys are actually growing colonies, mother colonies, in order to, uh, to harvest from them and to sell frags off of them, and that's their livelihood and their business. So what better type of person to get kind of the inside information of how they best uh, do it, not just in their facility, because some of those things may apply, but a lot of them won't apply, but also what they know just in general of being in the hobby for so long. And so that's why we're going to bring you right now all the way from, I think it's Glendale or Burbank. I don't know. He's going to tell us here in a minute to Joe Cap. Okay, so let's see. Hey, Joe, how's it going, man? Good. How you doing, guys? Hi, Terrence. Oh, man. So, how are things out there in uh, Burbank. my growing up neck of the woods where I grew up, huh? <laughs> it's hot. It's 96 today, so wow. to stay dry, keep cool, keep the water temp nice and low, and uh, yeah, nice and sunny, no complaints. Happy to be here. So, um, some of you guys out there, you, you might not know, um, but Joe is the owner of Unique Corals. He came around in what year? You and Fellman put it together in what year? 2012. So 2012. So they're on. Guess it's been that long, dude. We are getting really old. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, so 2012, they put that company together. Before that, uh, Joe uh, had started Manhattan Aquariums, which he still owns, right, Joe? Yep. 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 
And last I saw a picture of that, it was like the Lone Ranger in the middle of a, a skyline. Huh? I wish I had a picture of that right now to share. <laughs> feel that, yeah. So that whole area on the west side is blown up. I built the store there. Well, I did the store, started in 2005. And I uh, started in New Corals actually in the basement there. It was just a little side project once I saw people selling corals online in like 2006, 2007. And um, it went well, had a couple of hiccups, decided to move it to the West Coast. But yeah, Manhattan Aquariums is on the west side of Manhattan, right near the Javits Center. And it was just parking lots back then. It was just empty, desolate parking lots. And now it's the, one of the last small buildings standing. And the city is enforcing eminent domain. So we've got six months to a year left. That's oh, wow. two, three years now. Uh, but it looks like this time it's, it's for real. Yeah, I remember that area. Uh, I, 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 you know, I was in the tech industry for a long time, and we used to have trade shows. Uh, there was PC Expo and NetWorld Interop. Both were at Javits all the time, and so I was often walking, um, ironically, right by your store uh, for many years. Didn't even know it as I was walking from Javits to go get something to eat or back to a hotel or whatever. And it definitely has transformed uh, on that west side over there quite a bit over the last sure. twenty years, no doubt. So you're still running that store over there. How's business over there with the whole COVID thing? Uh -huh. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. This has been this has been tough. Um, the store has been, you know, we were closed and we we're open. We were closed and we we're open. Um, it shot down quite a bit, understandably so. And um, the bigger part of what we do there is is custom installations and service. And most of our clients have pretty much closed the door to us to not want us in. Um, so it's been very challenging. This is a new experience, not one that any of us really had any experience on how to maintain tanks without actually going there. And Apex has been amazing because we have them on most. Hey, I didn't tell you to make that plug. So we're doing <laughs> digital servicing, really. Your Apex is your OP drop, check your power, is it on, amp drop. So it's actually been one of the life lifelines that we've had to rely on. Um, uh, I know you didn't ask me to do that plug. <laughs> Well, that's good. I we definitely appreciate that, and I I I totally understand and believe it's true. And and uh, I I know I ironically um, so so I, look everything in in shows like this. I talk about everything, Joe. So um, so the funny thing is is that Joe, okay, Joe and I had a little a little tiff because. Tom, who's our best sales guy, okay, was the apex guy for Manhattan Aquariums, okay? <laughs> and now Tom is like the superstar sales guy at hold Neptune on, Systems. If you're going to go there, I got I got everything. <laughs> so there was a little rough water there between me and Joe for a while because uh, because we hired Tom away from Manhattan Aquariums, but Joe uh, Joe got things together and uh, he survived just fine, right, Joe? Yeah. Well, <laughs> today we want what's best for all of us and Tom included, and Tom is a dear friend of, of mine as well, and uh, it was a great move. Uh, the pay was greater, not going to lie, and uh, we supported him. And actually, it's worked out because now we have a man on the inside. And it's, <laughs> it's really nice to have that that personal VIP customer service at Neptune because you need it. Yeah, so, no doubt, no doubt. So, okay, so then uh, Unique Corals, uh, online sales, how are they doing during uh, during the COVID? Surprisingly good. Um, we do about half of our revenue is wholesale. The other half is retail. Uh -huh. uh, wholesale really, really dropped off quite a bit. Um, but a lot of people are home. They're, they're working on their aquariums. They're spending money. And uh, we're doing our best to, to provide for them and support them. And, um, and I'm hearing the same from a lot of online vendors that, you know, online sales is the one thing. When people were shut out of their retail, uh, they went to online. So um, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful for my staff that has, has come to work. We've split our hours. We've got people coming in at 5 in the morning and leaving at 10 o'clock at night. So we've taken our existing staff and just spread them out so we don't have too many people working at once. And uh, we, we couldn't do it if it wasn't for my staff. So uh, they're just amazing. No, that's great, man. And the, um, you know, the, the online thing, I mean, just in general, the, I think the hobby from stay at home has, was a big surprise for us. I mean, obviously going into this, uh, for us, Neptune Systems, it was a huge surprise to, to know what, I mean, our thinking was, wow, this is going to be a huge economic, you know, downturn. But in reality, um, something really interesting happened, which is basically the um, people stayed home. They weren't spending money somewhere else. And so yep. they were spending it on their aquariums and they were also enjoying them with their families more. And yeah. that meant that it didn't have as big of an effect on, on our segment of the economy as uh, we had feared. So I hope yeah. the same is, is holding out for you. It's, it's not great. It's not perfect. But, man, it's a lot better than we had, uh, we had thought it would be. So yeah. 
Anyway, we're looking at your t- your store here, okay, on Unique Corals. I don't know if you can see that on your feed or not, but uh, yeah, it looks familiar. Yeah, yeah, look at those colors, people. I mean, th- this is amazing stuff. Now, I mean, of course, all the naysayers are going to say, you know, Joe's taking those funky pictures with the strange lights and everything. But I can tell you firsthand, guys, because I've been there, and if you look at the pictures that were on the promotion for this uh, for this show, those those colors are are real i i've been there and you are open for walk-ins for people to come in and take a look or no we normally are right now with the covid restrictions we've kind of put a pause on it just so we don't get inundated we don't want more than 10 people including employees and myself at the shop at any one time right Uh, so right now it's really strictly appointment only but our our policy right now is no walk-ins but normally right normally normally you're okay with it because it's not usually a ton of people i mean because it you know you guys aren't kind of it's not like you're on a street corner, you're back in an industrial area, and uh, you kind of have to know to, to go there. But I, I am maybe maybe Joe won't like this, but I'm going to encourage you guys <laughs> to uh, if you are in the LA area to stop in. If you want to see an amazing facility with incredible uh, staff, uh, Joe's place is absolutely it. Um, okay, so when we're talking about running your store, right? Uh, that you have. Let's let's first let me ask you um, the the. The livestock that you get, okay. So, where does this livestock generally come from? Are these how much? Because you can tell me maybe in a percentage, or maybe you don't want to. You say I don't really want to tell you, but um, you know, I know places like when I've been over, uh, you know, on the East Coast to like Worldwide Corals, they have you know tanks that have their you know mother colonies and whatnot in them, and same thing with Top Shelf and other places, and then they, from time to time, cut a lot of corals off of those, and those are going to be the ones that get sold. And then there's a certain number of other corals that sometimes come in and basically are cut, healed, and aren't really, you know, aren't really coming from the mother colonies. How does that work for you guys? We don't have a, a hard and fast rule. We basically take the incoming shipment, shipments, we curate them, we look through them, we see what would move in our wholesale market, what would move in our direct to retail. Some of them will just you kind of call it chop shop, even though it's got a bad connotation, but that's the truth. You, know, you uh-huh. take a box or blast out, you frag it up, let it heal up, and then you sell it. Hey, you know what? I'm going to stop you on that one because this is one where I I agree with you. I don't like that derogatory term because um, I know know there's a ton of negative kind of feeling out there, especially from old timers, right? Like the Sanjays of the world are like, oh, we used to get... We used to get these colonies and they were like this and now you just get these tiny little things. But when you're talking about like taking care of the resource, right, it's like what better way than if you get one coral in and the guy sells it to 50 or 60 people, right, then selling one colony off, right, and needing that many more colonies out of, you know, it doesn't, it's not all out of the the wild either. It's coming out of farms, but still at the same time, they're animals. What do you think? Absolutely. And that's a great point. Um, great, great point. So you can take the same coral and now you just satisfy the needs of 50 reefers instead of just one. And that coral could die in transit. There's a lot of things that could happen. So uh, it's definitely much better for the coral. And the cost to entry is so much less. And if you're a successful reefer with a very limited tank space, I think most people recognize it's not just because you want so much diversity, you don't want to spend as much for a coral. If it's going to die, I'd rather lose a $30 coral than a $300 coral. And if you're successful, it's going to be huge and outgrow that area anyway. Is it true that it's easier, I mean, if it's healed, right, to grow a smaller coral to into a bigger one than to get, let's say, from whether it's from from uh, you know from a store or from somewhere else, a very large coral, and then bring it home and acclimate it and, and keep it in your tank? Because I've heard multiple things of that. So I think it just comes down to the larger pieces don't travel as well. They're more prone to nicks and damaging, whereas the small corals have already been through cutting and fragmentation. The weaker ones are going to die. They've been through a lot more. And there's a lot less tissue to to keep, uh, you know, to to keep healthy. Um, And they just seem to do better. You know, just they've been handled. They've been manhandled. They've been taken out. They've been cut. Uh, The sensitive ones have already perished. So, yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of. So so you do you you do some of the, the chopping and whatnot. Um, how much of the like uh, specialty coral, you know, grow it, uh, you're, you know, having your own mother colonies and, and, you know, kind of trimming them and pruning them as you need them. Do you do any of that? Yes. So we definitely have some farm tanks and one of our raceways in the far end is, is farmed corals. Um, it, we, you know, every ship and you could have 5% of it, 10% of it that you say, this has got to go into the farm and you'll make more money. And you know that those, some of these pieces are just 
they're so hard to come by. So if you sell it once, it's gone. I'd rather keep it, hold on to it, and be able to just keep pruning off of it. Uh, some shipments, there's just not enough. There's just no, I mean, there's not enough of those cherries to warrant isolating them. And it also comes down to, you know, we're a business. We have a lot of mouths to feed, and it comes down to cash cash flow. So some months we need the cash flow. We could take a piece and sell it for $800 or sticking in a farm, or two months later it could die, it could get stung, yeah. it could fall. Sometimes we go for the cash in hand. Very, very interesting. So what about the uh, the mix of types of corals? Are there types of corals that you guys more specialize in? Um, and this is all leading somewhere because we're going to talk about growth and, co and color, but I just want to kind of understand what your experience is there. I mean, is there a lot of LPS, is a lot of SPS? What is it? Uh, we do a, a, a good amount of everything. Okay. Uh, we're shifting lately more into SPS, but there's so much cool LPS, especially coming out of Australia. And, you know, with Bali being closed for two years, um, people got a little bit bored of the Australian Acropora. Um, so some of those real hot LPS coming out of Australia have been, you know, have been a saving grace. People have been really into them. They're hardy, do well, super colorful. Now that Bali's open again, there's a lot more diversity coming out of Bali as far as SPS. So we'll probably shift a little bit more to SPS. What about zoanthids? Do you do much in the zoanthids area? Because I know there's specialties yeah. like, you know, some people like Brandon, you know, uh, sure. you know, a good friend of mine, yeah. Brandon, zoanthids.com, plug for him. He yeah. uh, he does, you know, tons and tons of varieties of zoanthids, but that's really kind of a specialty thing, isn't it? Yes, yes. And we, we do zoanthids. We do, we do a little bit of everything. In fact, people that know me know that I do water testing. I do rock. I do installations. We do this. Now we're collecting in the Solomon Islands. We do wholesale retail. I, I do it all. I, I don't think I specialize in one particular thing. Maybe that'll change in the future, but I, I like to have my hand in a lot of things. Okay. So, um, so what, in, your, in your facility, right? So how long does a coral you know, end up staying there? Uh, at, you, know, you cut it, right? And you're going to then put it on a frag plug or something like that. What, how long does it generally stay before you can sell it? Usually, I mean, it depends on the piece, uh, like green star polyps, clove polyps. Those you can sell pretty quickly. They have really very little healing that kind of has to happen. But any of the, the corals like fabids or acans, those are going to have to sit two to three weeks minimum until you have a nice healthy layer of tissue, you know, coming over the cut edge. Uh, longer is better. So a lot of times we'll just cut them, forget about them for a week or two, and then we'll start photographing them and starting to sell them and starting that process. So typically a month would be ideal. Okay, so... Um... To the, to the colors, right? So you get a lot of corals in, I can imagine, at least some of the stuff I've seen when they come in, there's some things that come in, they're just amazing. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, they're, and, and then there are other things that, that end up becoming amazing, but both of them require some, some, something that you're doing to them to either bring out the color in one or keep the color the way you want it in another. How are you doing that? So the wild corals, whether it's farm, you know, for the sake of this conversation, we're going to treat maricultured and wild as the same because they're both coming out of the ocean. Um, they're going to react differently to our captive settings. You know, our nutrient levels are traditionally higher. The lighting is, I wouldn't say is, is in, more intense, but certain spikes, you know, in the actinic and the royal blues, you know, that people keep in their LEDs, those are super, super high. Um, as far as what we can do to promote certain colors, just by history, we know which corals would do better under bright lights and under lower lights. So a lot of it has to do with our past history, and we can predict where the coral is going to go. Um, but it's very, it's 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 very interesting to watch a shipment come in from Australia and then watch those pastel colors kind of go away within a week or so, and then all of a sudden come screaming back. And that's usually how it happens. So I don't get super excited anymore. A lot of times when they come in, they're just crazy colors. And then within a few days, they start to darken up a little bit as they're acclimating to our lighting, our chemistry, our nutrient levels. And then they're going to come back and kind of settle where they're going to be. So I think a lot of places take pictures right away and sell them. Well, they even sell the pictures that the exporters have taken, which is not oh, a good wow. representation of how that coral is in your own tank. So we let the stuff come in. We'll let it sit for a few days, let the colors bounce a little bit. Usually it bounces a little bit, again, for the worse, but that's a truer representation. And that's really what you need to sell if you're going to have a long-term business. Well, should, uh, should then customers expect the same kind of situation to happen to them coming from you then into their tank? 
So there definitely will be some shift because everybody's parameters are a little bit different. And I think we're kind of at a point now where most people are sharing a big pool of information. So even though there's differences in the way people keep their tanks, I think we're starting to see a baseline that's very similar in terms of PAR and nutrient levels and alkalinity levels. We're not seeing all these reefers keeping alkalinity, you know, 13 and 14 right. DK. Like we used to remember Mike Paletta's book, you yeah. look at how people used to keep all those parameters, DK 20, DK 18. Um, so my point is, it's going to be some color shift, but the biggest shift happens from wild to the initial importer. Very so, good. So um, yeah. as far as the, the water chemistry, is there is there one thing in particular? Again, we're going to talk about the hobbyist tanks and what you think people should do for hobbyist tanks, too. So I, I, I don't sure. want people to get that confused, and I know we discussed that before. But in terms of your facility, uh, is there is there something particular in terms of the water or the water parameters or a particular water parameter that is out of sync from natural seawater because you know it's important for, you know, either color growth or, or color or growth or health on the corals. For instance, you know, if you talk to somebody like, uh, like crazy, uh, Justin, right. Yeah, um, <laughs> right. Um, I can't with a straight face say his name ever. So it's, it's like, <laughs> um, but if you talk to him, you know, he's Mr. Uh, potassium 600, right. Okay. So, 1200. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, twelve hundred if you're him, six hundred if you're anybody else, and you'll be just fine. You know, it's a uh, uh, he's just crazy with that stuff. So that's just an example. Is there anything like that that you guys do because of things that you found out? I mean, we have some some tweaks that we do with the, with the color schemes and trace elements. Uh, nothing too unconventional. Some of my my staff, you know, they have their secret recipes, and you know, I guess you could say some of it's proprietary. But you know, I'm here to share information with with you and and, and everyone watching here. Um, the the truth is, the corals don't know where they are. They don't know that they're in a home tank. They don't know that they're in a facility. Um, the challenges of keeping corals in a facility is way harder. In fact, most of the best corals you'll see are in home hobbyist tanks. Why? Because there's only one person manipulating the variables. Very good point. When, yeah. When you have a staff of 13 or 14 or 15, and this one's got you know zinc oxide on his hands or sunscreen or doing this yeah. or frag two corals, you know what it's like. I mean, stability really is... Yeah, that's, is, it's absolutely, that's a very good point. It's one of the things I tell people all the time and in a lot of the presentations that I do is like the number one thing, people say, how do you have such a great tank? And as it's number one way is I don't put my hands in the tank almost yeah. ever because nothing good happens when you put your yeah. hands in the tank. Nothing, nothing good happens. Corals, you'll see on the bottom of my tank, there's coral f frags sitting everywhere. There might be a wisp of, uh, you know, of cyano or whatever, you know, and I'm not just going to, I'm not going to freak out and reach in and start to fix something because I'll either break something else or I'm going to, the stuff on my hands yeah. is going to go in there and that destabilizes everything in the aquarium. That's a very good point. I never thought about that in terms of um, facilities versus uh, uh, home hobbyists. And I didn't design my facility with that in mind. It took me a couple of years. And in fact, I, I was kicking and screaming to make changes to set up tanks that are more like, um, you know, hobby tanks or tanks that you kind of just leave alone. Because, you know, the truth is we're not there to see what our staff is doing. Even right now, as I speak, they're working on the tanks. Right. I don't know what they're doing. You just don't. Uh, and there's only so much you can do with, with testing and monitoring and surveillance. You yeah, just don't I, know. I, that freaked me out. <laughs> with that much in the in the breeze, that much investment and everything uh, to think that you've yeah. got that, you know, you've got a great staff. I mean, that's all you can, that's all you can do. So well, if you it, I want to touch on one thing regarding yeah, yeah. stability. You know, when your Trident was in, it was in its infancy, when, you know, Jim was working on it and, and, and whatever, um, there was one thing that he told me, the anecdotal evidence that when he was doing his tests and he saw that when he stuck his hand in the tank and when he fragged coral, the consumption dropped. Oh, yeah. You know, the alkalinity went up. So dosing the same amount of minerals in an afternoon where normally he would see the consumption increase and the alkalinity would drop, he saw the reverse happen. Mm -hmm. And the only theory he could come up with was that there was some kind of biological, whether a chemical stressor or a, a toxin put, produced by the coral, something that caused the coral to say, oh shit, I'm going to conserve my energy for growth and color and use it for survival. Yeah. And you can kind of see as a, a proxy for growth is your mineral consumption. In fact, with Triton, who often is a bragging right to see how many mLs of course seven you could dose a day. You know, it's growing, it's going 80 mLs, 90 mLs. That's indicative of how much uh, calcification is occurring with your corals, which is, is growth. But when he saw that, it kind of just hit him as an epiphany that, wow, even just sticking my hand in there and fragging one coral had a direct impact on the corals. So when we as hobbyists or as, you know, um, 
commercial growers are constantly, you know, we're paid to work there every day on our systems. We're actually doing more harm than we're doing good. So that's finding that balance has been something that I still work on today. And um, I'm going to break the news here for the first time. It looks like within Ooh. a year we'll be moving. So our new facility. Really? Um, yep. Yep. So um, we're starting to look at locations. I hope that's okay uh, that I'm telling you guys here. <laughs> the boss is in the other room. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> Just look. Am I showing that? <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, so hopefully within a year, we'll have a brand new facility um, and it's going to be built right. We're going to try to buy a building and build it to last, to, to stay. Right now we pay rent and... Um, I'm going to stay in the top. East Valley? It's okay. It's yeah. okay, man. This is, a, this is a show to talk about Reef and your your facility is Reef, so it's fine. All right. So cool. still stay in East Valley. So okay. Still that with that in mind. That was a segue where we're going to have a grow room, a true grow room, like individual hobby tanks, and we're going to have our farm that can be a lot more forgiving. Well, that's kind of what Worldwide does with their real nice, expensive corals, right? They have their, you know, their... their the scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No apexes on them, though, I don't think. Uh, yeah, but they have round-the-clock staff, so uh, you don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you say so. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so in terms of, uh, obviously, the parameters and those other things, okay, great. Uh, nothing spectacular other than maybe some secret sauce that, uh, that you guys have, maybe like three extra shakes of boron out of a Lowry's uh, seasoned salt container or something. But uh, <laughs> So there is stuff we do. Um, we have probably the only coral grow in the U.S. that has an ICP machine in our facility. Okay. So the ability to test it, you know, same day. So if we see a problem, we can throw it in the machine and test it. Um, that's it. It's not, it's so not do you wait thing. to see if, I mean, if you have it, if you have the, that thing in your facility, why wouldn't you test your water even every day? It's not that difficult, well, is it? It actually does cost a lot of money to test it, and it fills up spaces that we can be using to test customers' water. Uh, it's just overkill. It's not intended to be used every day. Uh, we'll do it like every week. Uh, sometimes we'll skip a week. We get a lot of samples in, do it every other week. But we definitely pay close attention to the major ions, uh, especially strontium and boron, and then the trace elements as well. And, um, you know, you can't let any of those shift too far down because those those pigments, it's mostly supported through anecdotal evidence, but they're very responsible for coral pigmentation and to play supporting roles in coral growth. Uh, we're just starting to peel back the understanding to what role these trace elements play. There's a lot of back and forth and, um, and now, it's an How do you adjust time. them then? Do you use water changes mostly or do you, do you individually um, dose? Our systems, we have six systems that are 20, about 2,400 gallons each. So doing a water change, it's quite a bit of salt water to change. Um, we have concentrated uh, bottles of Triton additives, just the elements. So if we see our strontium is low or our iron is low and molybdenum, we can just dose that. And with the Triton printout, if you say that it has 2,500 right. gallons, it'll tell you how many mLs to dose. How many bottles? The <laughs> yeah, exactly. when you I mean, water changes is another way to, to replenish. You're basically, you know, concentrating those things that are low and diluting those things that are concentrated. So it it it, it ends up with the same same result. Different so so a couple of things coming from the comments because we got to pay attention to these guys out here, right? Because they're not giving me enough questions. Just so uh, uh, just so you guys know out there, give me give me some questions that I can ask him. But for sure, we've got Jim Welsh out here. So Jim Welsh is on the stream. So he heard your name drop. Uh, his ears were burning. Um, uh, Clint Warren asks, uh, uh, where is it? How do we order an ICP test from unique corals? Uh, just, I mean, the easiest way is to go online and buy it. But we are going to be doing, aren't we going to be like, sure. Should we say it now? Yeah. We'll get yeah, yeah. Away from you, right? You know what? Since he's the first question asker, give Clint Warren a free Let's ICP test. One. Okay. Let's Since he asked the question. Perfect. So I think we've got five of these to give away. Maybe I'll do yep. something else like ask a letter from uh, <laughs> from the alphabet from Joe, and I'll pull the first person who put a comment in with, uh, with their name stars. That's stuff like that as we go. Uh, but uh, don't see any gray hair on my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, no kidding. But uh, that's also another good segue too to put on that we do have a special from Unique Corals that uh, that Joe has put together very graciously only for the people who are watching on this stream and for the next two and a half hours it looks like now until eight o'clock Pacific time. 
Uh, if you want to get 20% off on the amazing corals at uniquecorals.com, you just basically send an email to info at uniquecorals.com. That, at, at, obviously, between this time, right, between now and 8 p.m. Because if you don't, yep. it's time stamped. You're not going to get the deal. And then they'll send you a coupon code so you can get 20% off, okay? So definitely do that. It's info at uniquecorals.com. So it's really nice of Joe to uh, be putting that together from Unique Corals. So, and you'll most likely get that email tomorrow because uh, it's after hours here today. So we, if it's time stamped, I'm sure we got the email. You will get an email tomorrow. Perfect, perfect. And we'll bring that up again before the end of the stream. So now um, there's obviously the water parameters, but you know what I think is probably the biggest. Uh, you know, game changer for the color side is the lighting. Lighting it plays just a huge impact in uh, in the in the coloration of the coral. Yep. Both uh, the uh, you know the spectrum obviously of the lighting, but then again also the intensity at different spectrums, and then um, you know ultimately your DLI or your um, your daily uh, light interval. So how much time the the lighting is o over the coral plus the or times the the par basically, which is the overall intensity. So those things really, from I'm, my understanding, are the big biggest. What what is your take on that, and how does it apply? You know, first and foremost in the um, you know in your facility, and then you know for a home user. I would say lighting flow and food. If I had to pick in an order, I would say probably food plays such a big role. Lighting is obviously up there with it. Um, and flow, you really can't underestimate the need of flow, especially in these high light conditions. You have to have that flow to move these, you know, these oxidizing radicals out of the coral's tissue. Um, so all three are just as important. So is that know. what it is? It's the, it, it's basically them to be able to get rid of waste as opposed to um, bringing food to them? It's both. Yeah, I mean, it's both. Um, you know, when you have these high light, intense environments where, you know, they're, they're fertilized in the water for lack of better words, right. is limited and the photosynthesis, the engines of photosynthesis are really cranking. There's a lot of oxygen uh, that's being produced and the corals have to constantly break that down or it could burn the tissues and higher the light, the more flow you need. I think that's a problem that people experience. You know, you set up your tank and you design it a certain way with small corals, but then once the corals grow, you start to block off those channels of flow. And oh, then you yeah. have pockets in the middle where the light is still intense, or maybe you upgrade your bulbs where you get new lights, and now you've just ramped up the intensity, and your flow has been cut down by 20, 30, 40 percent because of the growth. That's when you start to get those pockets of death. Yeah, uh, I, I, absolutely. This is 100 uh, percent. We are on the same wavelength on this one for me, and I know, you know, from my own personal experience, but I, I've seen in the hobby these um, these oscillating steps that we've taken where you've we've had. Uh, good or decent lighting, right? Or really good lighting with the the, the um, metal halides and T5s and whatnot, and it was really good. And then we had a certain amount of flow, and we got the flow better, and that was kind of okay. And then we went to LEDs and really started cranking this light and cranking these spectrums, right? And all of a sudden, there wasn't enough flow, and so it's yeah. like you got to now take what you thought was great flow and crank it up again. I mean, I I have seven uh, of our wave pumps running in my tank, right? Uh, you know that are you know probably averaging averaging like twenty five thousand gallons per hour of you know flow through the tank or something like that, and it it absolutely makes a huge huge yeah. difference. And when yeah. they're not running, you can see it. Um, yeah. you can see it in the tank. Um, yeah. definitely so flow. That's pretty cool. Critical is the flow, obviously the lighting, and knowing, you know, just because you've got one coral thriving at 400 par doesn't mean the next SPS is going to thrive at that. So you've got to really give the coral time to build those pigments to ramp up to protect itself, because the more light that's hitting the coral tissue, the more energy there is for that zooxanthella, that, that, that symbiont, mm -hmm. to produce food and sugars and oxygen, converting carbon dioxide to, uh, to you know, carbon and, and oxygen. So the coral needs time to develop those reflective pigments so it doesn't get burned. Very good point. Um, so, so that's that's why they have the, the the color, right? So it's a it's a buildup, and it and if you're running low lighting, right, that's why you've got to just slowly ramp it up, right? Because it's uh, they've got to kind of uh, build up their own sunscreen, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, Remember, Zocatella is like this with his. Uh, there's yellow, and I mean, they're brownish yellow. There's carotenoids and there's chlorophyll A, the two main types. 
of pigments there. Um, and then the corals produ produce all of these pigments. Um, and that's where the trace elements come in. So you need the trace elements present. You need just the right amount of nutrients. When you start to get your nutrients a little bit too high, you can get some browning out. Well, here's a question for you that's very pertinent on it. Matthew Duarte just asked, um, let's put his question out there. What methodology would you use to take a coral from brown back to coral? So that's very pertinent to what you're just talking about. Perfect. Brown back to what? Back to back to having col to being colorful. So, what methodology would you would you use to take a coral from brown back to colorful? I know there's a lot of variables there, so it's yeah. There's it's, a lot of variables. I would focus on your, probably your nutrients first. Nutrients and lighting. If you know your lighting, you know the corals around it are showing good reflective coloring, and your PAR is you know suitable 200 and above for let's say SPS. Then focus on your nutrients. Typically, when your nutrients get a little too high, and you know it's not just the nutrient levels; it's the balance. You know, there's been studies where you have low phosphorus and high nitrate, the corals can't survive. The, the, the symbionts just can't function. So it's having that balance. Even carbon is in there too, the CNP ratios. So typically a hundred to one ratio. If you have a nitrate value of three PPMs, uh, target phosphate levels of 0 0.03 would be ideal. And you have those going up and down together. And if you can get them low, you know, two to three PPMs for nitrate, 0.02 to 0.10 for, for phosphate, those seem to be really good safe zones where your coral is going to produce a lot of color. The algae is not going to be growing crazy because there's not too much fertilizer in the water column. The corals will be limiting the engines of photosynthesis by putting these colorful skin pigments, you know, the, the sunscreen, so mm -hmm. to speak. Right. Everything will be balanced. There is one analogy I want to give that I give to people that, that seems to work. Um, it's, it's like drifting. Running a successful tank is like drifting in a car. When you're, you're coming around a turn, let's say you've got a Porsche or anything, you come around a turn, a you've got your car in the back, you're trying to hang in there, you're in complete control. Right. But you've got just the right amount of gas and just the right amount of traction that keeps it from spinning out of control. Your gas pedal is your food, is your nutrients in. Your brakes and your traction is your exporting of nutrients. So you can be at any speed and be in complete control if you can throttle your food and your nutrients in and know where your traction is. So Terrence might be able to feed 30 grams of food a day. The next person might be feeding 10 grams, but they both have balance. And the nutrient levels might be completely different because they both control of that uncontrolled car. So to speak. That's a great so, analogy, and 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 it really is when you think of the people who are are starving their tanks too, that have these nutrient levels that are just, you know, completely, um, uh, you know, to zero, and then bad things happen. Perfect example, and he'd, you know, make an example of him. Kurt, the uh, president founder of, of Neptune Systems, has got a tank in his office, and it's a relatively young tank, and that's exactly the problem he's had recently. He's he got some uh, acros in there; they're growing like crazy, doing really really well. And, uh, you know, has an incredible skimmer on the tank and uh, uh, has a, uh, an algae bed, a small little algae bed in there with a, with a light on it, right? And it was just pulling everything possible right. out. And he just, you know, he could not, at least for him, probably um, couldn't stomach putting that much food in that he would have needed to put in <laughs> um, in order to get that balance, like you said, to keep it, you know, still on the road, right? And, and, and not spin out. Yeah. So it's well, de definitely you know, like important. It's a, you know, they look at you drifting right now. Your tank is a perfect example. Like, well, what's Terrence doing? Now his level's here. I'm going to take some of that. But a newbie would all of a sudden spin out of control because he put your amount of brakes or your amount yeah. of gas. It's the balance of your tank that is making all that work, all those parts working in harmony together, all the forces together. Okay, so we got some other questions because I like to keep this interactive here, Okay. So, so uh, Steve Simon's asking, are you guys importing Indo Euphilias yet? Uh, we are. Um, the first few Indo shipments we just brought in from Bali Aquarium, from Vincent Chalius. Unfortunately, we could not get CITES for Euphilia. They kept moving the goalposts. And as you know, Indo has been very hard to get corals from. So we're fortunate enough just to get hard corals. But on our next shipment that's coming in, there should be Euphilia. So that's exciting. Next question says, are there any cherry corals that aren't listed on the site? If so, how can one see or order those VIP slash concierge? If you PayPal $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so yes, we have. I mean, just the the, the, the cash business is the cash walk-in business is probably pretty yeah. strong with Joe. I would imagine. I'm okay. I'm kidding. I'm really kidding. Now we have a lot of calls that just don't make it to the site for whatever reason. There's just not enough of them. Um, so we're always kind of trailing behind. The photographers are chasing the inventory to, to get it up. Um, so I would definitely stop by, and we'll give you a concierge treatment. There you uh, go. You know, and everything, or just email me a list of what you're looking for. And if we have it, and it's not on the site. We'll definitely do, um, you know, private sale. We do that all the time. So these are, I think, the WYSIWYG right now that you got up on there showing yeah, people. Some stock and some WYSIWYG. So they'll say if they're, uh, you know, which one they are. Oh, because I clicked on the WYSIWYG thing. Oh, well then, yep, that's WYSIWYG. It's actually blurry on my screen. I don't know if it is for others, but no, it's it not. Could... It's it's just because you're, you, it's it's coming back through th Skype to you. That's why. Ah. Got it. It's hard to see, but anyway, those are, those those are about as VIP as I guess you get, unless you go in and get the special treatment, you know, from. Uh, it's true. Those are all wizzy wigs, but from, if from somebody Joe. looking that's not there, and we also have connections to local hobbyists. So if you're looking for something we don't have, we can maybe pull some strings from somebody we know that has it. So Eddie, uh, Eddie Solar from Florida says, so you advocate a one to one hundred ratio of nutrients. Is that what you're advocating? He's asking. Uh, it's 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 a commonly accepted target that seems to produce really good predictable results across the board for people. So yes, when your nitrate and your phosphate levels seem to be in that magical one to a hundred ratio, that's when you can see really good success, really good coral color. There's no one. I, I was very careful in my answering because there's no one specific answer that works for me or for everyone else. Oh, there's so many variables. There's so yeah. many variables. I mean, if you want to have my tank, do every single thing like I do. More likely, do every single thing I don't do <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not, I mean, that's one of the things I tell people. I don't, you know, if you do everything kind of right in the beginning, it makes everything else a lot easier later on. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite corals that I've got from you recently, because uh, cause Joe always treats me right when I come through town, um, and I saw this coral when I was there last time, and it was a big, fatty, big, you know, I mean, big blunt of a coral, as uh, as somebody might say on one of the blogs, and it, it, it basically has these pink tips, and it's uh, the Robusta, right? Yes. Yep. That thing is growing like a beast in my tank, and it's just so beautiful, and it is such a centerpiece. I've got it down near the sand. And yep. I, you know, I love corals that I don't see many people have, right? Or yep. if they have them, they don't look like nice and good like they should. And yep. that's one of those corals that, uh, man, I saw it there in the tank. It looked great. Um, and after I got it, I, I heard from a couple people, oh yeah, it's not going to look like that, you know, later on, whatever. And for whatever reason, flow or light or whatever in my tank, it's just an amazing coral. So yep. I they get confused with the abrotenoides. Um, but it's a thick, thick stag. It needs super high flow. They're co collecting on those outer reefs where the flow is just crazy. So it's a testament to, you know, those are open, clear water, high energy reefs, which have been proven to be the more challenging corals because that, that environment is it's pretty challenging to replicate. And they're, uh, the corals just, they don't like to be in anything but those conditions. I kind of stuck it on its own new rock and put it down on the sand, like right in the middle of kind of the tank. So it would just get a lot of light and flow, you know, from all right. sides. So right. evidently right. it did, uh, it did well. So right. yeah, Steve, Steve Simon was saying, show it, uh, show it, Terrence. I don't know if it's going to, this, this thing is, uh, oh, look at that. That's not working now. See, I already blew it. Ah. <laughs> there I go there. Cool. I think if I go here and then that's Joe by himself and then I go yep. there and then you guys will hear me for a second and I think it's right One thing I did want to say Terrence if I could just cut in is the the need for food I think a lot of people underestimate the nutritional needs of coral and now that you have people like Rich Ross, who hopefully is still listening and didn't just do a quick drive-by, um, and Jamie Craigs from the Horniman Museum, um, they're seeing that when you slice open a coral, when you frag it and you see those eggs, you know, to get to that point where you have sexually mature co colonies, you know, you need so much food in that water column. Those these corals are animals that are really, really hungry. So, you know, even though we keep low nutrient levels, we need to feed a lot. And there it is. Yeah. There's the the robusta. That was just like a like a little fork when you gave it to me. So, yep. Uh, yep. it's uh, it's definitely happy in the tank. Small colony now. <laughs> yeah, it's doing it's doing well. So, um, okay. So as far as lighting is concerned, you know, back to the lighting question. 
um, because there's spectrum all over the place, and there's some of these uh, branded, uh, you know, spectrums. I guess you would call it like the Radeon AB Plus and various things like that. What's your What's your general take on on spectrum and intensity and all of that? Obviously, you have something different in your in your store, but let's let's do the hobbyist side right now. What would What would you be telling people? Well, you know, you want to do a broad broad blue. As you know, the corals really react the best to the blue light. You know, the royal blue, actinic, uh, those are the things that are going to allow those fluorescent pigments to really return that light back to you. And I, I recommend that people, you know, take their spectrographs and kind of, you know, go up the nanometers and, and see which reflection gives the user the, the best look that they're going for, especially if you're into kind of seeing it in that ultra glowing, ultra fluorescing phase. But for coral nutrition and energy, you definitely want to hit that whole 400 range, even up into the reds. So, you know, having something broad works. A lot of growers, including ourselves, run a very tight band of blue, you know, covering, you know, the, the, the from like UV, purple, indigo, actinic, uh, up through blue, and you'll give the coral pretty much all of its nutritional energy that it Basically needs. like from 400 to say 470 is yeah. like where yep. you guys are. Yeah, and that's where most of the good lights are, are you know, are built to, to project now. Right, right. Well, a lot of the lights don't don't have a whole lot of juice down in the, you know, 400 to 420 range. Sure. The, there's yeah. not a whole lot of them that are doing that super well. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the situation for lighting is a good question here from, and it, and it brings up another question is what's the optimal par for, a, uh, for a mixed hobby wise. And the, the one thing I'm going to uh, maybe push this out here too, it, people, um, one of the most common things people will say, and you probably hear this from people in the store and whatnot is say, well, what kind of tank do you want to have? Well, I want to have a mixed reef. Mm. And it's like, okay, so you've picked the hardest thing you can possibly ever do, right? Yeah. Do you agree with me? To balance all the needs of everything. Well, get a tall tank then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have a, a lot of flow on the top, a lot of light on the top, and then a little less in the bottom. So you almost have two tanks in one. So the, the shallower it is, the harder it is to do. But, you know, it's a testament to the coral's ability to adapt to this closed water yeah. box environment. So. Taking it from the ocean, sticking it in a box, I think is 98% of the challenge. The difference between an SPS and an LPS and a mix is probably only a few percent, considering what the coral has gone through to get to where it is. So we're seeing, like in your tank, you've got LPS growing in there. You've probably got some zoanthids or soft corals thriving. Uh, so there's definitely a balance that, that you can achieve and have that mixed reef. I, although I, I do have some, I can tell you right now that it is – to do all of them great, okay, yeah. is a near impossibility in my opinion, yeah. um, unless you have segregation in the aquarium. So if right. you have uh, lateral segregation in the aquarium, it's a little bit easier um, because even even vertically, you have all sorts of other challenges with, you know, coral shadowing other corals and different things. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it is for the, for especially, like I said, for the newer hobbyist or whatever, it is the most challenging thing to be able to do because once you, once you adjust something over here, it changes something over there and you're yeah. doing this for this and it's, it's super difficult. Um, you know, so the, you know, the question of what's the optimal par, uh, you know, one of the things I thought was an interesting, uh, uh, thing is uh, that uh, I saw BRS do with uh, measuring the worldwide corals tank, which I thought was super helpful to get measurements all through a particular aquarium on there. And ultimately, the for me, and I don't know how much of this you have uh, studied or looked into, the biggest uh, miss, I think, in BRS and everybody's um, uh, discussion of uh, light on the aquarium is not considering it as DLI, which means... It's light on the aquarium is like raindrops in a, in, you know, coming down for the day. Right. And it's it's a cumulative energy. And so while you can't have a, you know, over lighting a coral to burn it, let's say, or give it, you know, the sunburn uh, outside of that, it's it's in aggregate of how much light you have. So in talking about the par value, it's not enough to talk about the par value. You have to talk about the light cycle. What's your thoughts? Uh, that's one that I haven't even studied that much, to be honest with you. Uh, Dana, needed... Dana Riddle's, you know, stuff is really good on this, you know, and talking about the DLI and in, in the Hawaiian reefs and whatnot. 
Yeah, so we just use reputable brands. Right now in our shop, we use G4s, uh, Ecotex. We have probably 150 of them. I think, you know, is it safe to say that the par values goes hand in hand with the, the DLR? So if you have a very strong, high intensity, high par light, you're getting adequate lighting and also reading the corals. You can tell if the corals need more. To answer the, the, the question that the person asked, there really is no ideal par value for a given tank. It really depends on the specimens that you're going to keep in there and also where in the tank you're going to be measuring the par value. But certainly a safe range, you know, would be somewhere in the 200s you get the needs of the SPS and hopefully not burn the LPS and softies, which could be a little bit, you know, placed a little bit lower in the tank. But no, I haven't, I haven't just. And that's a, out. that's an interesting thing too. I mean, and, and I agree with you. It's in the, in the 200s to the 300s on the SPS, right? And so many people, you know, are running these super high par values at the top of their tanks or they're listening to the other, you know, coral gurus that are like, dude, if you want the, you know, your tenuous to get all the colors, you need to do this and, and blast it with 780, you know, par or whatever. And, yeah. and, and my thing, as I was saying, is, is that it's, 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 there's a time, you know, a time element there, right? So you, you may only be able to do that for what, three hours, you know, uh, but you could run it at 350 par for nine hours during the day, right? Mm. That kind of a yeah. thing. So, all so, right. So let's give away, let's give away another, uh, a, another ICP test from Triton, uh, West Coast, you know, OG Triton. Uh, give me a, uh, a, a somewhat popular letter, no Z's or X's, okay? And we'll give it to, I'll give it to the first person whose name, since you can't see all the comments anyway, whose, whose last name begins with that letter. Give me a letter. C. C. C, C, C. Robert Cray. Robert Cray, okay? Send an email to info at uniquecorals.com to get your free ICP test, okay? Well, let's, yeah. do, let's do another. Give me another letter. Uh, J. J. You think somebody's got a last name with J? Okay. Uh, Should be Jones or Johnson or something like that. <laughs> okay. Let's see. You're going through all the comments, man. This, this is why you guys got to comment on the, uh, you I'm know. I'm an R. We'll see if Rich on, is still. On, on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Right. Uh, yeah. Like he needs another ICP test. Right. Uh, look at you. Look at this. I'll tell you what. John Philip Sousa. Okay. That works. John Philip Sousa, email info at, uh, at uh, uniquecorals.com. And back to the, uh, the special that we got, guys, so you don't forget. It is 20% off for all viewers who email info at uniquecorals.com by 8 p.m. Pacific today. That's 11 o'clock on the East Coast. And yep. uh, you guys will get 20% off your order of some of these incredible cherry corals that are out there. Uh, we've got all kinds of stuff. Here's the WYSIWYG. Uh, at, as long as they last, he's got uh, he's got Monty's. He's got what chalices. Got yep. I mean, a little bit of everything. Good, good diversity. Look at all these corals. Okay, so definitely. Oh look, there's doorbusters. Look at this. There's one doorbuster there. You got to dunk oh, yeah. it. Yeah, that's an old one. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> hey, it's your site, man. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else we got? So he's got a bunch of LPS. So definitely, uh, you want some some great corals and get a good deal on it. Uh, email info at uniquecorals.com. Okay. Uh, well, Solomon Islands. You know, we have our facility there that we received. Tell us about it. that. So yeah. So Tim Kelly and I. Tim used to work for me. Tim um, worked also in the Solomon Islands, and we decided to do a business venture there. And so we built a small facility right on the water. Um, we're we're going to buy a boat, and we did two export shipments. So it's our facility. We have all the permits. We got two shipments in, and then COVID-19 happened, uh, which basically just shut the plans and everything. So everything's ready to go. We have the staff. We have the permits. We have everything ready to go. As soon as the airlines uh, are back up and functioning, we can actually get freight out. Then we'll send Tim. He's now in L.A. We'll send him back there and start resuming shipments. So the first two test shipments yielded a lot of good fruit, a lot of good stuff. We've actually got the farmers who have been farming for many, many years there uh, are growing corals as we speak. So we're going to be shifting from the little bit of wild quota that we have to hopefully 100% farm corals within a couple of years. So anything that's really cool, we're going to stick it to give it to the farmers. If they own the coral. We basically buy it from them. And uh, it should be a really cool business venture that will be rewarding both for us, our customers, and for the locals there who will have a good, sustainable source of uh, income. And that is a very important thing I want to touch on that a lot of people don't get, especially the haters out there, um, the haters of our trade, uh, that there are people who rely on this this trade in a sustainable way. 
yeah. to provide for their families who have a hard enough time as it is um, yeah. to do what they do. And the fact is, is that if they don't have this, they're going to find a way to provide for their families. And there are lots of really bad ways that they can be providing for their families uh, out there, whether it be shark finning or who knows what, uh, to, to do what they have to do just to eat. And so, you know, I, I commend you for putting something like this together, you know, to help out another group of people to get the, the trade there um, and, and doing, uh, doing what's necessary to bring these corals in. We certainly have enough market here uh, for people to, yeah. to, to consume this. And, the, I mean, the only thing I'm really curious about is where's my cool gems from the Solomon Islands? I mean... Sorry, you broke up? Sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Actually, some. I'll send you a care uh, a care pack where you got to come down and visit. You have a couple of really cool things. Uh, I would love it, man. I'd love it. Like I said, I, I, I treated that robusta well, and I got a few other corals in here, obviously, that you've given me that I don't even know the names of them. You know, it's like you say, it's this, and it's, you know, monkey butt number three or whatever. And and uh, I just go, yeah, okay, I'll put it in my tank. It looks good. Got it. But, uh, Terrence, we got to touch base. One thing, this is a growth conversation. Yes. We didn't touch upon pH and how important pH is for the calcification and rapid growth of corals. Okay. So people, you got to keep your pH up there. No longer are we just trying to target 7.8 to 8.3, which keeps things alive. You start to get over 8.2, 8.3 regularly and use your, your apex to see where that pH is. Set up a calc washer, doser, do a scrubber on your CO2, get some fresh air intake, you know, into that skimmer, into that sump area. Any of those things will help. Lighten the bio load, uh, anything to get that pH higher. So how did you how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I didn't come to the conclusion. I mean, uh, you know, all these people. Uh, I shouldn't say all these people. It's it's pretty well established now. The higher the pH, you're going to see growth. You know that that high pH, it's 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 carbon. Um, I don't know. know. Sanjay would say BS. Sanjay is running what seven point six on his pH. You know, I saw well, it for myself. Think corals alive? Are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you talking about the same Sanjay who says, why are my corals dying? You mean that Sanjay? <laughs> An absolute anomaly. He could have a 48-hour tank crash and his corals will spawn. That's <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just messing with you. No, I totally agree with you. My tank, uh, I, I think I need to uh, calibrate my pH probe because it's been low for the last month or so. Um, I don't do nearly as much of that kind of maintenance as I should. But generally, I was always having a very high pH in my tank. It never went below 8. It was always up around 8.27, 8.3 or whatever. And definitely the growth uh, was there. So your recommendation is what, Calquasser? Uh, well, calcwas is one way to do it, but I would look and see if there's a, an issue plaguing it. Maybe there's not enough fresh air in the room. Um, that's the first thing that I would target. You know, get some more fresh air into there. People are experiencing really good results now with CO2 scrubbers. And if you loop it on your protein skimmer, you're scrubbing scrubbed air. So your media lasts a lot longer rather than scrubbing air, you know, CO2 laden room air. If you can run a line in from outside, you'll see a big difference. One, uh, we see it on our on our apexes and a lot of our office accounts. It's a great example. We have beautiful reefs in offices that are packed full of people. Then on the weekends, the pH trends, you know, 0.2 higher. Uh, and then sure enough, Monday, people are in the office respirating. Yep. The pH drops. Yeah. The so, um, interesting yeah. thing. Um, that uh, I've, I've spoken a little bit with Ryan from BRS about and, and I think is a good thing people with Apexes could do to help that um, and not go broke on the scrubber is actually putting a splitter off of your, um, off your skimmer intake and then running yeah. through a solenoid valve to the CO2 scrubber and then run the solenoid valve off of your pH in your tank. So you could basically run the bypass through there. And there are um, other solenoid valves that would hook to the, the apex too, not one from us that, that can run at three eights or you can run a pinch valve or there's many ways to do that, to, to turn that on and off because it is a big expense to run that CO2 media. Uh, if you know, that scrubber. You media. Need, right. So when the pH drops below whatever your target set point is, then you have that solenoid open for the people, I guess, that didn't. An insider that. hint on that is the scuba stores sell, like, I think it's the, the cheapest uh, media, isn't it? Uh, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I think the but scuba I stores, I think, sell the, the scrubber media. You can get the, the cheapest price on the scrubber media. So we don't sell scrubber media, so I don't, I'm probably messing somebody else's business up by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but well, yeah, uh, one tip that, that we know really uh, seems to be 
uh, supported by a lot of people. I think that you know, the, we, the, the it, it's the stability, really. I mean, really, the stability, stability, stability. Oh, yeah. You know, because when and, co- when corals are are trying to adapt, they're not growing. And when you're able yep. to keep the temperature stable, when you're able to keep the the alkalinity, you know, stable in the tank, calcium, magnesium. Yep. As much as you can stable, keep your hands out of the tank. All the corals are going to do is take in the light, take in the food, take in, you know, uh, respirate with the flow and grow. I mean, for sure. Yeah. And that's why I like refugiums. And, you know, we, we, yeah. we push the Triton method because it just, the, the fundamentals of the Triton method match all the things that I believe in for growing corals. And you have this nice, beautiful bed of algae, a diverse mix of different macro algaes. And it's like an insurance. It's, it can grow with the needs of the, the, the waste in the water. And if there's not a lot of waste, the algae bit kind of dies back. You could also trim and harvest it if you're experiencing, you know, low nutrients. Absolutely. So that, that's a real easy way. It doesn't die like bacteria does, you know, none of the dangers of dosing carbon and vinegar. You can easily overdose. You can use up all the oxygen too fast. Amen. Amen but, to all of that. I know, I know people like Rich Ross don't think that they're the way to go. Um, but you know, the heck with Rich Ross, you know, uh, Rick Ross. <laughs> <laughs> the heck with them, right? Um, because I run one, and I think they're amazing, and I have for the longest time. And what is surprising to me is I know there's a lot of gadgetry around doing these. I'm not a huge fan of the gadgetry for this particular purpose. Um, I like the, the basic kind of uh, Cato growing area. And yep. if done right with the right kind of lighting, by the way, many people run way too intense lighting over uh, the refugium areas, uh, and it actually stunts growth, actually burns it, mm-hmm. actually creates a lot of um, uh, of issues just because they're running too much light to it. Yep. Um, there was some false, in my opinion, uh, kind of myth information uh, that was given out at one time, like, oh, you got, you're competing with the display, so you need to have so much light to compete with right. the display light or whatever. I'm okay. not... Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a believer in that. And uh and it, like I said it was evidence kind of with Kurt's tank, which is it's got the little, you know, it's a it's a water box with a little water box, you know, area in the front that he put the algae in and it just it knocks down that the phosphate nitrate yeah. in the tank. Yeah, yeah. And it helps to keep it balanced. It also moves some toxins and excess trace elements and it's a great mechanical filter. You know, if you can get that ketomorpha growing right at the surface of the water level. I had a great talk with the, the Triton distributor, uh, Raul La Vista, um, in Mexico. And he's got a design where the ketomorpha is growing three, four inches in the sump. Water can travel underneath it and then comes up right before the weir wall and the growing edge of the ketomorpha is doing all the growth. So when you harvest it, you take the old edge and you leave the growing edge and because Cato really grows right at the water level, it mm-hmm. acts as a sponge, a living sponge, and it's a perfect mechanical filter, a perfect ecosystem for all of the things that are oh, eating, yeah. the pods and everything. And it grows and dies back with the needs of the aquarium. Yep. And it keeps your nitrate and phosphate levels in check. And it just adds that stability factor that, you know, it's 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 like training wheels on that drift car. So I recommend it. Well, we got to start to shut this one down. So, uh, you know, it's been a great talk on a lot of different topics. Um, loved cool. having you on. I hope you'll come on sometime in the future, you know, down the road. Um, yep. uh, you know, maybe we'll do one on site or whatever like we've done before. Um, any last thoughts you want to leave with anybody? Uh, is there any questions? Um, uh, I'm no trying thoughts? to look. I mean, there's a lot of comments, so we can take a couple more questions. Uh, but, I think but, we but, touched but, on, you know, the lighting, flow. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. pH, uh, trace elements. Uh, The ICP testing is a great thing to see if you've got problems building in your water. And if anybody gets their water tested and they want to reach out to me, I've seen so many of these tests. I can give you, you know, unbiased, uh, you know, advice. Uh, I've seen high aluminum and high tin and high chromium. And we can talk about where those things might be coming from. And you want to catch them before they become a problem. And also know that you've got strontium, molybdenum, all those things close to natural seawater, which has proven to be pretty damn good at growing corals. So, uh, ICP is definitely something um, that you want to uh, that you want to do on, uh, you know, a few times a year is my opinion. Right. It's not something you need to do, in my opinion. Well, uh, replace you... home hobby kits. Right. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I just I just put one wasn't a question it was a message up there which uh, which Rich said uh, give me free stuff. Uh, yeah. So one 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 last free ICP test. Give me another letter. Uh, give me another letter. Uh, let's do T for Terrence. T for Terrence. Let's see who the know. first the first last name of with a T starting yeah. with a T. 
This is, this is, you know, I, I would have thought there would be more questions. So we must have done a great job of giving people. There's a lot of comments in here that says this is a great, uh, a, a, a great stream. So, you know, thank you so much for, for being here for this, Joe. Well, if this check doesn't bounce that you're going to mail me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just want me to bring you buckets of corals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's paid it forward. There, do you believe there is no T? There's no last name with a T. I'm just going through here. What about ICP? Is there an ICP hey. anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> Their name is... Oh, here it is. David Trong. David Trong. Right. Email info at uniquecorals.com to get your free ICP test. One last time, if you want to get 20% off from uniquecorals.com, email info at uniquecorals.com. Let them know before 8 p.m. today and they will send you a coupon code tomorrow so that you can fill up your cart and get some awesomeness of all of these great corals. So, great. All right. Oh, and you know what? You said something in the beginning. I forgot. I wrote it down. Okay. This is your next slogan. Maybe it's just the apex. Maybe it's just the apex. Okay. Like it. Yeah. It just has a, it has a sound to it. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds good. Maybe All right. Me. So anyway. when you get a lot of water in that place behind you, we're going to come back and, and do a tour of that. Is that okay? Yeah. I do a little sneak peek uh, the water box. There's a lot of stuff going on in there, man. There's a lot going on. Yep. You gonna, yeah. Uh, so that's just a tease. So there's the tease, guys. Joe, thank you. Oh, 1,200. <laughs> Joe just wants to keep going, man. He just okay, wants to keep going. I got to shut it down. We like to keep these around an hour, you know, um, although some people would go on and on and on. Um, next time you can tell, you can, you can ask, you can talk to David Trung when he emails you about micro bubble scrubbing. <laughs> okay. So take care guys. You know, uh, we're going to be on again two weeks from today for Let's Talk Reef. Don't know what we're doing yet, but mark your calendars for Tuesday. That would be June 23rd. Thank you for joining us. Maybe we'll have somebody for Control Freak Wednesday next week. And and until next time, enjoy those fish, you know. Thank you for joining us. Take care, Joe. Thank you, guys. Thank you. For